Hello, and welcome to the training module on understanding application performance with the POP metrics. My name is Jonathan Boyle, and in this session I'll be introducing you to the POP metrics, which are fundamental to our approach to performance analysis of parallel software. After this session, you'll understand both why it's difficult to understand the causes of poor performance of parallel software, and you'll also have a foundational understanding of the POP metrics. Now, these are two related topics, as it's the problems understanding performance issues that motivate the POP metrics and gives them a context in which to use them. So I'll understand both why it's difficult to analyse performance, which is based on the data limitation of traditional scaling and efficiency plots, and understanding trace data. So I'll be talking about what trace data is and why trace data is difficult to analyse. And then I'll cover the idea behind the POP metrics. And I'll introduce the first high-level POP metrics, which you might want to use. These are suitable for understanding some performance issues when running parallel software over multiple CPU calls and multiple processors. And at the very end of this session, I'll briefly mention some additional POP metrics, which can be covered in additional sessions. So I think we all agree that performance is key for parallel software. We have our disposable multiple processors, for example, in mobile devices, desktops, laptops, and so on. And we may also have access to large HPC machines, supercomputers, which contain many multi-core processors. And so we write parallel software with the aim of running over multiple CPU cores and of getting faster performance. And in theory, huge speedups are possible. So it's really important to understand if we're making good use of the hardware. We want to know if our speed up is close to the maximum possible. And ideally, we want the speed up to be equal or close to the number of calls used relative to the single call performance. Because anything else is just a waste of resources, whether those resources are hardware, electricity, or cloud costs. So we can use the traditional performance metrics of relative speed up or efficiency to try and understand performance issues. And for these, we measure the runtime for our executable for a range of n, where n is the number of cores or compute nodes, typically. And then we calculate the runtime scaling or efficiency relative to the reference case. The reference case is going to be typically one node or one core. So speed up is the reference time divided by the time on n cores or processors or compute nodes. And efficiency is the reference time divided by n times tn. tn is the time on n cores or processors or compute nodes. So here's an example of some traditional scaling efficiency plots. On the left hand side we've got speed up and on the right hand side efficiency. And it's very clear from these plots that the performance is not ideal. So they're telling us something useful. You can see that as we increase the number of compute nodes from 1 to 8, speed up uh, deviates from the ideal and the efficiency drops from 100% to around 40% on a compute nodes. So it's telling us something useful, but there is a problem here because the reference case in this example is a 68 core compute node. And on a single compute node, the speed up and efficiency is always one. So this is one reason why measuring performance is difficult. These metrics don't tell us anything about parallel reference cases. In this example, we don't know if the performance on a single compute node is 100% or 1% or even less than 1%. So we know nothing about the absolute performance. But also these plots tell us nothing about the causes of poor performance. Uh, for example, is there a problem with the load balance across the cores? Are some of the cores idle for some of the execution? Is the parallelism adding overheads? And so to understand performance, we usually end up adding an additional two steps. And we'll generate trace data and then interpret trace data to profile the performance. So at this point, in case you're not familiar with trace data and trace files, I'll briefly describe what they are. The important thing to realize is that using suitable tracing tools, we can measure data at various points about what the executable is doing and store this information to a trace file. So a trace file will typically contain timestamps plus various information about what's going on at that point in the execution. Trace, tracing tools will typically also measure hardware counter data at those points. So 
For example, we can record the number of processor cycles and instructions issued since the last measurement. So for fa parallel performance analysis, the tracing tools will typically record at least all the parallel events. And the tools will vary in what they actually record, and some tools can record a lot more information. This means the trace files are often huge. Often they're gigabytes of data for fairly short computation because there's so many parallel events. Once you run your execution with a tracing tool and generated your trace file, you'll use some kind of trace visualization tool to try and understand the trace data. Typically, the visualization tools will display timeline views, which will show different event types per core as a function of time. These are often very detailed, often far too detailed to resolve at anyone at, across the whole execution time. So you often have to zoom in to very small regions of the timeline to actually resolve the detail. And the tracing tools will often generate various metric data. In my experience, there's many, many different metrics which are calculated by the trace visualization tools because there's potentially many interesting things that you might want to look at. And the amount of metric data can often be overwhelming. So another reason why understanding performance issues is difficult is because analyzing the trace data is hard. It's typically many parallel events during execution and the trace data is too complex to actually view on a single timeline. So you end up zooming into small sections of the timeline to actually see what's going on. And then you've got no real understanding of the relevance of that section of the timeline you're looking at. And the trace visualization tools will give you an overwhelming amount of metric data, which you need to try and make sense of. So what you really want at this point is to know where to start with the trace data, have some kind of sense of what it is you're looking for in the trace files. So you want some kind of idea about what it is you need to know first. Because there's many possible causes of poor performance. For example, there might be imbalance in the amount of computation being undertaken per core. There might be dependencies between computation on different cores causing synchronization issues and the cores to be idle for some of the execution. There may be some additional work because of the parallelism. For example, Sometimes you'll find that some work can't actually be parallelized and has to be replicated over the cores. So as you increase the number of cores used, the total amount of work that you need to undertake increases. The parallelism will often add overhead. So actually implementing the parallelism might mean that some additional work is required. Sometimes there's memory issues, for example, on modern, uh, modern hardware, there's often non-uniform memory access which can cause problems. And you might also find that it's actually a reduction in the processor instruction throughput. For example, the processor frequency might be reducing or the number of instructions issued per cycle might be reducing. So when you start looking at the trace data, it's really useful to have some understanding of what it is that's impacting performance and which issues you want to address first to try and understand the trace data. So at this point, if you've got an application that's performing badly and you've got trace data that's very, very difficult to understand because it's very complex, it might be quite tempting to think, well, I'll just live with the poor performance. So it's useful to remind ourselves of why performance matters. Usually the hardware is very expensive to use, but even when it isn't, improving the parallel performance can add a lot of value, it can reduce your expenditure, mean you can get your results much quicker and it might actually mean that you can implement novel solutions which wouldn't be possible otherwise. So there is a lot of value in understanding and improving performance. But what we really need at this point is a method to help us understand the trace data. And this is where the pop metrics come in. It's a very simple idea but a very powerful idea. And the idea is to devise a simple set of performance metrics using values that we can easily extract from the trace data. And the pop metrics consist of some absolute efficiency metrics and some scaling metrics. Another important aspect to the pop metrics is that different metrics will indicate specific cause or causes of poor parallel performance. So with the pop metrics, we can generate a small set of performance metrics, which are easy to calculate, and then use these metrics to understand the causes of poor performance 
and to have some kind of understanding about what it is we're looking for in the trace data. And there's some obvious first questions that we want to address first. The first, fairly obviously, is how good is the parallelism? The second thing that's important to consider, which is easy to forget, is is the total time in useful computation constant? Often it isn't. Often as you increase the number of cores to undertake your parallel computation, the total time in useful computation increases. And in this context, useful means computation outside the parallel libraries when the cores are actually executing your code. So using a trace visualization tools, there's some data we can usually find fairly easily. For example, we can measure the sum of all time in useful computation. We can usually find fairly quickly the maximum time in useful computation where the maximum is taken over the cores. And if we've got access to the hardware counter data, we can usually find out the number of processor useful cycles and instructions. So let's think about what we can calculate using this data. Well, our first question was how good is the parallelism? In an ideal world, we will split our useful computation evenly over the cores with no overheads from the parallelism. So in this ideal world, the ideal runtime would be simply the sum of time and useful computation divided by the number of cores. So we can use this ideal runtime to define uh, a parallel efficiency. So the ideal runtime is simply the average useful computation, and we can define a parallel efficiency average useful computation divided by the actual runtime. This tells us how close we are to the ideal. And it also measures an absolute efficiency. And to measure whether the time in computation is constant, we can measure the total useful computation for a reference case and then divide that by the total useful computation as we increase the number of the cores. And we can also introduce some child metrics for computational scaling. So if we define our useful instructions per cycle, useful IPC is the total number of useful instructions divided by the number of useful cycles. And our frequency is the number of useful cycles divided by the sum of useful computation. We can then calculate some submetrics for computational scaling. We can measure the useful instructions per cycle scaling, the useful instruction scaling, and the frequency scaling. And we can multiply these three scalings to give us the computational scaling. Another important metric to consider is how good is the performance overall. So we can define a global efficiency, which is the parallel efficiency multiplied by the computational scaling. And this is essentially the parallel efficiency that would be obtained if the time in useful computation had remained constant. If the time in useful computation remained the same as in the reference case. So we now have this hierarchy of metrics. And we can use these with MPI, OpenMP, pthreads, etc. And there's a hierarchy because the global efficiency splits into parallel efficiency and computational scaling, and the computational scaling splits into instructions, IPC, and frequency scaling. Just using this simple set of metrics, we can get insight into the overall performance, whether there's a problem in the parallelism or the computation, or perhaps both, and also whether the poor computational scaling is down to uh, increasing instruction count reducing instructions per cycle, rate, or reducing frequency. And as well as using these metrics to understand the causes of poor performance, we can actually use them for benchmarking as well. So we can use them to compare performance before and after code modifications, and they're very useful for that. So now I'm going to show you a few examples of using this set of the pop metrics. So in this example, I'm running on one, two, four, and eight compute nodes. And I've color coded the data. So the values in green are good. We should see a scaling close to one. And values become increasingly red as we get towards zero. So looking at the eight compute node case, we can immediately see that parallel efficiency is poor. And parallel efficiency actually reduces as we increase from two to four compute nodes. It's also interesting that parallel efficiency on for this case is actually good on a single compute node. So we don't have to worry about the single compute node performance. And the parallel efficiency of 0.34 tells us that around two thirds of the runtime 
on eight nodes is overhead from the poor parallelism. And 34% is actually the amount of time due to useful work. You can also see the computational scaling is poor in this example, 0.41. So the use, time and useful computation on the eight nodes is roughly twice that on, or more than twice that on the single node. And we can see very clearly that this is down to poor IPC scaling. And we can see the instruction scaling and frequency scaling is good. Another example, a slightly different performance. We can see in this example that the main problem here is within the parallelization. Parallel efficiency on eight compute nodes is 0.47. So around half the runtime is due to poor parallel performance. An obvious next question we might want to ask then is what is the cause of this poor parallel efficiency? So even though these metrics are telling us something useful, we then have some additional questions we might want to start addressing. Even though we can't see the cause of the poor parallel efficiency, we know there's something to address here. And we can also see in this example, the computational scaling is fairly good. It's not ideal, but it isn't bad. And in this example, the poor computational scaling is down to the instruction scaling. In this example, IPC scaling, frequency scaling are both good. So in this example, the instruction count is increasing as we increase the number of compute nodes. And another example, on this example, we're looking at multi-threaded uh, code. So actually plotting the number of CPU cores. We can see yet again that the parallel efficiency is poor. Um, around 40% of the runtime is due to poor parallel performance. And we can also see in this example that computational scaling is poor. And in this case, IPC scaling and frequency scaling are the cause of the poor computational scaling. So at this point, there's an obvious next step, because as we saw in these examples for each case, the metrics were quite, quite helpful in identifying the causes of low computational scaling, but they didn't help us understand the causes of low parallel efficiency. So the next thing we want to do is to extend these metrics for specific parallel methodologies. And we can do this quite easily by splitting the parallel efficiency into a suitable set of child metrics. And ideally we have one child metric per source of inefficiency. And this is why we might want different metrics for different types of parallel methodologies, because for different parallel methodologies, there's going to be different sources of inefficiency. So for example, for MPI, we can devise a set of metrics that tell us the cost of any load imbalance and the cost of any time inside MPI. And we can devise metrics that will tell us if the time inside MPI is due to data transfer time or time where the calls are idle because they're waiting for data transfer to start. Uh, alternatively, for OpenMP, we want to understand different costs. Typically, we want to understand the cost of any serial execution outside the OpenMP regions. Uh, essentially, this is Amdahl's law. And we want to understand which are the inefficient OpenMP regions and why these OpenMP regions are inefficient. And for each of these sources of inefficiency, we can devise a new set of pop metrics. And these pop metrics are topics for further training. Another question that you probably want to uh, want me to tell you something about at this point is what tracing tools we use in POP and which tracing tools you can use. So in POP we typically use the following tools they are actually developed by some other POP partners. So we use X-Tray for tracing and Parallel for visualization and we also use Scorpi for tracing with Scholastica for post-processing and Cube for visualization and we also use a tool called PyPOP which uh, automatically generates pop metrics from X-ray traces. And if you want to understand how to use these tools, then the best place to look is on the pop website for learning material and further online training covering these tools. You can use other tracing tools. For example, we've used Intel's VTune in the past. So if you've got a favorite tracing tool, then you can probably extract the data you need fairly quickly using those. So that brings us to the end of this training session. Uh, if you want to know anything more about POP, then please visit our website or email us. And you might want to follow the POP Twitter and uh, look on the POP YouTube channel for the additional training material.
Thank you for listening.